You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their inventory of classic vehicles and follow them on Instagram at Commonwealth underscore classics. Thank you, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, podcast number 97 for April 2021. This is the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by Ford about Land Rover owners. I'm your host, John Costage. I have had two beers already today, just for your early warning. Joining me over Zoom are Harold, Morgan, and Dixon. Welcome, gentlemen. Good day. Have you had any beers? No, I haven't. Not yet. Okay. Not no. since about 1999. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> It was uh, Taco Tuesday. I decided to partake in good tacos and good beer. Since you had tacos, you only had two beers? Last beers were last Rover night. Next beers are next Rover night. When's the next Rover night? Uh, Friday evening. We are continuing the challenges and mysteries of the Prince of Darkness that is inhabiting Alistair's Series 3. Oh, so you're drinking while you're wrenching. That's lovely. Of course. That's the only way to do it, right? That's lovely. It guarantees more of them. Well, there you go. And if the goal is to not get it finished so you have more things to, to do to get away from life, then go for it. But it is a series vehicle, so it eventually will be finished, unlike, I think, some of the plushies where you'd be at it for a long, long time. Well, there are people who can turn a series truck into an epic decades-long thing, too, so... Really, Dixon, by the time you fix one thing, something else will no longer function on the series. That's possibly true, but <laughs> as that's that's my opening to do note that there are probably more 1951 Land Rovers on the road than there are of your favorite Freelander. Our guest this month is Daniel Smith, a lifelong Land Rover owner and product rep at a Land Rover dealership in North America. We had a great conversation about his fleet being involved in the movie industry and delivering Land Rovers to those who can afford it. Or who cannot be bothered with coming to the dealer to get it. I think it's probably more of a privacy issue. Don't want to go to the dealership. you know. They don't. Well, they can afford to have their people do it. So, yeah. yeah. As always, thanks for your comments, follows, likes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. The podcast is now available on YouTube under the Account Center Steer podcast. And be sure to subscribe through whatever means you listen to the podcast to have it automatically delivered when it is posted. You can also get in touch with us by leaving a voicemail through the website, record your comment or question, enter your name and email and send it. And please consider supporting the show, especially if you have been following Oxford, enjoying our interviews with figures in the Overland and Land Rover community and liking our coverage of most things Land Rover. You can be a regular podcast supporter through Patreon, be a one-time supporter through Buy Me a Tea, or show off your support by purchasing a t-shirt or sticker. Visit our website, centersteer.com for all the details. If you're a business and interested in reaching the Land Rover community through North America and the rest of the world, there are sponsorship slots available. The podcast averages over 600 downloads a month over the past year. And thank you to Commonwealth Classics for sponsoring the podcast for the past several years. Time for the news. Jaguar Land Rover sales suffer COVID-19 reverse despite fourth quarter rise. So JLR retail sales suffered a reverse of more than 13%. During its latest financial year, as the COVID-19 pandemic continued, the auto giant has posted a fall in sales of 13.6% for the 12 months to March of 2021, while Jaguar slumped 30.5% and Land Rover reporting a 7.1% fall year on year. That's actually not that bad if you think about it. 7%, especially for Land Rover. And considering the year we had, that's just not that much of a drop. Overall, JLR sold 439,588 cars in the year, 97,000 for Jaguar, 341, almost 342,000 for Land Rover. 
for the fourth quarter, 123,483 vehicles were sold, 12.4 higher than the same quarter last year. Jaguar posting a 7, 17% fall and Land Rover a 22.6% rise. So there's your uh, Land Rover saving the bacon. Well, it sounds like it's you know tied to the shipments of the new Defender. China sales were up 127% compared to a year ago when that market was heavily impacted by COVID. Sales in North America were up year on year by 10.4%, while other regions remain lower than pre-COVID levels. Overseas markets were down 10%, the UK down 6.8%, and Europe was down almost 5%. And another article here gave us a breakdown of the Defender. The award-winning new Land Rover Defender contributed significantly to the overall year-over-year -year growth with 16,963 units sold in the quarter. Just to repeat, almost 17,000 new Defenders were sold last quarter. In the quarter versus the four years of the legacy Defenders in the U.S. Other Land Rover models with increased sales in the quarter include the Disco Sport, which was up almost 29%. Range Rover Sport up 21%. The OG Land Rover, or Range Rover was up almost 15.8%, uh, was up 15.8%. Jaguar models up of the quarter included the XF, the XE, and the F-Type, which was up 55.8%. <laughs> well, they, they sell like two. I think they sold three versus two last time. So there's your sales. I think things, uh, despite, as Harold said, despite all the problems, doing okay. I think doing well. And JLR expects premium car sales to continue to grow this year in China. And that was from JLR's chief financial officer in China, Tim Howard, speaking to reporters at the 2021 Shanghai Auto Show. JLR will start making first plug-in hybrid vehicles in China this year. And overall auto sales in China surged in March with the for a 12th straight month. And the world's old biggest car mark leads the sector's recovery from the COVID pandemic. So I mentioned that just simply to reiterate to people that Land Rover's positioning itself as a premium brand, probably in much of the world. And I'm not sure how uh, Harold will take the next article because it, A, it includes Jerry McGovern, but B, it includes the future of Jaguar, which includes no SUVs. Well, I like that part. Well, they still look like in a whole family matter, though. <laughs> well, it depends on, on how much Jerry gets his way. Jaguar's future design direction as an electric-only luxury brand will be, quote, unquote, shocking, according to JLR Design Chief Jerry McGovern. McGovern, JLR's new chief creative officer, is at the heart of the operation to galvanize Jaguar following CEO Terry Bollare's reimagined plan outlining dramatic, drastic shifts Jaguar will make between now and 2025. It will become an electric-only brand. It won't make SUVs. It will create a bespoke electric car platform for its own exclusive use. It won't launch the electric XJ replacement, writing off some 300,000 pounds million, excuse me, 300 million pounds spent on its development. Speaking exclusively to Auto Car Magazine, McGovern says, quote, Jaguar designs will be compelling and jaw dropping. One word I like to use is exuberant, even shocking, but in a good way. Our new cars will resonate with customers on a visceral level. You will look at one and think there's nothing else like it, unquote. In my book, he says, the only thing that has to look traditional about a Jaguar is the badge. I really don't think anything else matters, unquote. Well, that's Jerry. That's Jerry. Nothing matters to Jerry unless it's something Jerry has drawn himself. But uh, beyond that, I think maybe you shouldn't refer to an electric car as shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't think that's good, good PR. No. Unless you're planning on infusing it with lots of copper. Well, we'll see. I mean, that's that's all I can say is we'll see what what. I mean, I like not it not at, not making SUVs. I, I like well, really, I like all of their direction they're going with all the stuff. Just it's a matter of what are they going to look like. Even though they say no SUVs, I think they're going to be CUVs. They're going to be that crossover, you know, mid mid range, a little higher than than a than a car, right. but lower than yeah. an SUV. Depends on how they wanted to find that term, I guess. But yeah, it's it would be nice if it was all sports cars and sedans. But yeah, I think you're right. It probably won't be. I think it's going to be more look more like the was it the I Pace? Is that the all electric one? That's yeah. It's not massive. Yep but it's still higher than a passenger car. Okay, JLR in Australia is going to adopt a permanent five-year warranty. JLR has joined key premium brands, including Mercedes-Benz, in switching to a five-year warranty. All Jaguar, Land Rover, and Range Rover models will adopt a five-year unlimited kilometer warranty 
from the 1st of April across vehicles purchased for both private and business use. Prior to April 1, petrol and diesel-powered JLR models offered a three-year, 100,000-kilometer warranty uh, with the electric I-PACE bundled as standard with five years and 200 kilometers of coverage. Uh, we did a comparison to the U.S. The U.S. warranty is... Yeah, in the U.S., every new Land Rover vehicle is covered by four years or 50,000 miles, whichever comes first, and a six-year unlimited on corrosion. Right, and you'd burn through those 50,000 miles in Australia pretty quickly, so the, the, that's why they're doing the unlimited. It makes yeah, sense so. because everything's so much farther apart in Australia. They just put lots and lots of miles on their stuff. The other thing you have to look at is what are what's exempted out of the warranty. Because if they were to go and bring that here, I know that the corrosion perforation warranty right. here uh, omits things like road salt and bird poop and things like that. <laughs> Mud. And there's a lot of road salt usually in the Northeast of the United States or central Canada and such. Right. Not so much in Australia. No. So the corrosion warranty, I'd be pretty cheap to, to administer over there. Oh yeah. Cause Make things a lifetime. don't, yeah, exactly. Things don't rust in Australia. For uh sea salt and all the beach driving they do down there. Well, there'd be that. That's a good point. I guess the yeah, assault from the from the ocean could could affect things. The war, I guess, it, it only applies to to vehicles registered in the outback. <laughs> well, but I suspect that sea salt is probably not as bad as salt from the roads cleaning them in the wintertime. You'd be surprised, actually. Really? I, you go out to California and you hang out on the coast, and and like even the parking meters are, are rust out in a couple of years. It's nasty, but. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. The The spray just in the wind blows that, and, and it, it does more than you think. Yeah. The semiconductor crisis affecting the auto industry has uh, struck Land Rover as the shortage of semiconductor processing chips continues to impact automotive and technology industries. Several car makers have been forced to close production lines temporarily, and Jaguar in particular is pausing operations at two of its largest production facilities for at least a week due to the shortage of semiconductor chips. The manufacturer's Castle Bromwich and Hellwell factories in the UK will implement a limited period of non-production. Operations could restart seven days later, depending on the state of the semiconductor supply. Affected models include the Castle Bromwich built Jaguar XE, XF, and F-Type, and the Hellwell built Land Rover Discovery Sport and Range Rover Evoque. The Sully Hall facility that builds the Range Rover and the Jaguar F-Pace will remain in operation, as will the Defender factory in Slovakia and JLR plants in Brazil and China. So I think that tells you that the models that are selling well are going to continue to be built. Well, it may also have to do with supply in the UK being different than supplies on the continent. But all, there's also the aspect is it's Peugeot, who's with some of their production, they're going back to uh, analog instruments to continue production. There you go. Wow. <laughs> good Good on them. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. Being French, they'll probably just make the, the needles sweep the opposite direction just, just to be different, just to be fun. Uh, diesel gate for Land Rover. This is out of the LRO magazine. JLR is among many car makers facing allegations that some of its diesel engines have defeat devices, enabling them to full emission tests by creating lower emissions in a lab test than in real world driving. A law firm in the UK is currently representing around 1,500 Land Rover owners, claimants in England and Wales, and believes around 365,000 JLR vehicles could be affected in the UK. All diesel Land Rovers are registered from September 2009, when the Euro 5 came into effect, are potentially eligible. The claim rests on various reports that in real-world driving, many Euro 5 and Euro 6 engines produce excessive NOx emissions far above the legal thresholds. Engine software used to manipulate emissions during testing was deemed illegal by the European Court of Justice in, in December 2020, prompted a renewed fury of lawsuits against manufacturers. Land Rover's keen to highlight the Department of Transport's assertion in 2016 that, importantly, our testing has found no evidence that other manufacturers are using software of the type used by Volkswagen, unquote. First off, they'd have to, it's on the this legal case's onus to prove it because any of these emissions tests and so on, they're all laboratory-based. It's like mileage tests and so on. Everyone goes and takes the same test. How they perform in the real world is a whole different discussion. Okay, so they do pollute more. All right, I'm sure that everyone's do. But is there software to do this and figure this out? Okay, 
here's a here's an ECU, guys. Go find out how it works and uh, prove that it cheats. Well, isn't that what they did in the Volkswagen case? I mean, well, no, Volkswagen, Volkswagen fell apart for a lot of different reasons, um, including the fact that they, when discovery was done, there was uh, there was evidence in the company that this had, this had happened, but. Volkswagen. Um, it was caught by how they ran the, per- the, the the thing actually acted differently with parameters. So if you take a Defender and stick it on a rolling road and it does this and then it does that, they were able to go and figure it out with Volkswagen. Right. Yeah. If it was on the test bed and if you move the steering wheel, when you move the steering wheel is when the defeat device yeah. came into play, as long as the vehicle wasn't moved. Or if the hood's open. Yeah. I think that, that was, yeah. that was Cadillac. <clears throat> Well, and the thing is, in in Europe, it was legal until 2020 to 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 do these things, and and so different companies had different schemes, and Fiat had had a little timer, and 18 minutes after you start it, it shuts everything off, which is just long enough to do a test. G- General Motors isolated a whole bunch of different reasons why they need to shut it off. Cause that was the law was if you could prove that you needed to, for, for the longevity of the engine, um, you could t- defeat or turn it off, disable it. So general motors actually produced, published a report on all the different parameters that could cause issues and, and just, and then they reprogram their software to address each one of those things. Just the fact that it's a uh, hundred meters uh, above in, in altitude, above the uh, highest testing station and uh, temperatures that are just above and just below the standard temperature for the emissions test, you know, that stuff like that, you know, that's, that's just coincidental. Even better was British Leyland in the early seventies when they had to have their cars meet the emissions they sent their uh, people around to every emissions testing place in Western Europe at the time. And they found one in France that had faulty equipment. So they sent all of their cars there, there to be go. emission tested and passed. <laughs> Although I guess that really probably has minimal effect here in the U.S. since they don't sell diesels here anymore. Well, Canada, the United States nationally they do their own testing and, and in the u.s it's been illegal to tamper with this stuff from day one so defeat devices have always been a no-no jlr's in motion ventures invests in battery recycling and manufacturing technology jlr's venture capital and mobility arm in motion ventures has invested in battery resourcers a lithium ion battery recycling and materials company the sustainable technology firm holds the exclusive license for an innovative closed loop process that integrates battery recycling, refining, and materials engineering to convert scrap end-of-life batteries into new material that can be used to make new batteries. The investment in battery resources plays part of the plan for JLR to establish sustainable solutions for end-of-life batteries, minimizing waste and creating a circular economy across the battery supply claim chain. Supply chain. Told you I had two beers. The investment from InMotion Ventures and other strategic partners will fund the development of a commercial st- scale processing facility with the capability to produce 10,000 tons of batteries annually, along with the expansion and enhancement of the production and analysis facilities in Michigan. So at least they're thinking about battery recycling and what to do with the with the old batteries. Yeah, and that's going to become a much bigger business as we run out of lithium. And just run out of batteries. Right. <laughs> So why not try to take the old ones and repurpose them somehow? Right. Plus, it's just, you know, everybody talks about how, how green battery technology is, but it's not. It's it's harmful to the planet to make them. And then when, when they expire, if you just leave them sitting around, that's not good for the planet either. Uh, Honda is aiming for 100% electric vehicles by 2040. So the Japanese car giant Honda said Friday it would aim to have electric and fuel cell vehicles account for 100% of all sales by 2040. Honda has said it wants the ratio of electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles sold in major markets to hit 40% by 2030, 80% by 2035, before hitting 100% globally by 20. That's impressive because they offer just a really wide variety of types of vehicle. It's not just like Jag going all electric in five years. Well, they just, it's pretty easy. They just make certain kinds of cars, just make those electric. But Honda makes, you know, little stuff, big stuff. Yeah, they make all kinds of things. Yeah, chainsaws and you know, scooters and yeah, bikes and, and lawnmowers and yeah. Yeah. But they're 
they're specifically looking at vehicles for this 100%. So, but does that include the motorcycles? That's a really good point. Does that include their, their, their jet aircraft, (laughs) corporate jet? It is unclear here. Land Rover launches special versions of its most exclusive Range Rover. Because that's what we need, more exclusive Range Rover content. How long is this name going to be? I am not even. I, I think by the end we'll get to it. I think we have the name down by the end of this article, I think. We'll, we'll see if you find out. <laughs> Let me know. Land Rover's unveiled special editions of its most exclusive Range Rover model. The super exclusive ultimate version of the Range Rover SV are being made on, it, on the edge of Coventry at the Carmaker's SVO Center in Wrighton. The SV Bespoke Personalization Team has said the new Range Rover SV Autobiography Ultimate Editions represent the pinnacle of Land Rover's luxury SUV family. The Ultimate versions elevate the range-topping Range Rover SV Autobiography and Range Rover... (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) I did a good job not tripping over it, but... Say it three times fast. (laughs) And SV Autobiography Dynamic Models, even higher with a suite of complimentary hand-finished... SV bespoke features. And I want to be clear that bespoke is capitalized. So I think that's part of the name. Uh, Buyers will need to have deep pockets though, with the cheaper, the two models costing almost 150,000 pounds combination of newly formulated satin finished orchard green paintwork, complemented by a Navaric black roof and copper detailing. Gloss black knurled infill and copper edged metal Range Rover badging on the bonnet and tailgate, a copper plated and black enamel SV rondelle on the B pillar, SV rondelles embroidered on all four headrests, plus illuminated ultimate edition tread plates. Will the copper go and oxidize to a nice bronze green? Well, that's why you have your butler to polish it. Valet, I think it's a valet. No, the, 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 valet. Co- yes, the copper right. is infused. The, the copper is infused throughout to help control perspiration. Oh. <laughs> the long wheelbase SV Autobiography provides a first-class style cabin, including power closing rear doors, reclining airline style heated and cooled semi annealine leather rear seats provide over 1.2 meters of rear leg room, hot stone massage function plus calf and foot rests for rear occupants. I, I want to know how that works off-road. I mean, would, would that be good while you're going off-road to have your calves massaged? Does the, does the seatbelt work keep you in the seat if you recline in an air, airline position? These are questions. I have questions. Uh, I don't know. And I'm still working on the guy who's too lazy to close his own damn door. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be a safety hazard if you're off-road and there's an obstruction somewhere? You don't, you may want to manually close the door and not have it automatically closed for you or power closed. I, I guess they're not taking these guys off-road, right? I think that's the problem here. Some, some jackass will at some point. Eventually, you know. In about 20 Eventually. years, we'll get one. The, let's the, third <laughs> the third owner will. The third owner will. The new Range Rover. Oh, here it is. Here it is, Dixon. See if we get this. I get this name correct. The new Range Rover SV Autobiography Ultimate Edition, 565 horsepower supercharged V8 is priced from 183,706 pounds on the road. The dynamic equivalent is priced at 147,000 pounds. But somewhere they have to add on to that the SV bespoke after the ultimate or the uh, the dynamic versions. I wonder, I mean, bespoke is capitalized here. I wonder if it's a trim level. I don't know. They have, they call it SV bespoke. Is that the name of the, I don't understand. <laughs> if you guys understand. That's the idea. If, okay. you, if you can't understand, you don't deserve to own it. A new Land Rover Defender wins major industry award. The new Defender has been declared the 2021 World Car Design of the Year. The Defender emerged triumphant in a vote by 93 international journalists from 28 countries that make up the World Car Awards jury panel. It is the sixth World Car Design of the Year win for JLR, placing the Coventry car maker at the top of the awards design league table with no other manufacturer claiming as many. The coveted award has previously been won by the I-Pace in 2019, the Velar in 2018, the F-Pace in 17, the F-Type in 13, and the Evoke in 2012. 
the defender was up against some stiff competition with other two, with the other two finalists being the Honda E and the Mazda MX-30. Either six for the corporation or one, the Defender is the only Land Rover. Uh, no, the, the Evoque. That's a Range Rover. Oh, it's, but it's under the Land Rover. It's uh, okay. I'm just saying, you know, most of the, the winners were Range Rovers. There's only the been one, also a Range Rover. Uh, okay, but aren't they all Land Rovers? Well, yes, but you know, it, it just shows the focus. Okay, understood, understood. So, they're, so they're all in the name. They're all in the Range Rover family. So the Defender is still award-winning. That's uh, well, the yeah, there. but it didn't win any awards. The original Defender didn't win awards. What's happening? Well, it wouldn't show up for it because it was too busy doing important things somewhere for someone. <laughs> so we don't know if it hasn't won because it couldn't show up to get it. And this is out of Troy, New York. And it's about the new Defender. I'm going to read some of it. And the reason I'm reading some of this, you already know these things, but the point of this is to show what I think the the new Land Rover Defender owners, at least that's the audience or the buyers that Land Rover is going after. I think that's what this article is kind of appealing to. So it's just a different way of seeing the new Defender that maybe we don't look at it. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's not really not that long, but I would still read about three paragraphs of it. For consumers, there are many choices out there in the off-road Jeep type vehicles. That's where Land Rover steps in with its new boxy Defender. Oh, do we really love this one? Its off-road ability is superb. While its exterior and interior appearances are different and very likable, but most importantly, it's solid as they come. Similar to Honda's discontinued boxy element, the Defender can make it through the woods and go hiking, camping, and more. There are tons of additional options like a tent, ladder, etc. With Ford's new Bronco and powerful new 4XE Wrangler, Land Rover did just the right thing in providing consumers with the upscale version of the boxy ute in what seems to be a new category in off-road vehicles. We enjoyed the Defender 110X in the snowy mountain terrains of New York's Shawnagunks. Anybody know that I say that right? Shauna Gunks, where we had no issues maneuvering in multiple elevations and overcoming road debris. For the upscale Jeep needing consumer, Land Rover is a great choice for the money and the ruggedness and off-road ability is nothing short of superb, but its solidness is what stands out the most for me. You are sure to overcome anything in your path. I just, how I think how others see it. That's, that's the, the point of that. I think reading that. And it was uh, as tested, $85,000 American. I think that was three times when he said, if you're looking for a Jeep, get a Land Rover. And as we know, uh, Prince Philip passed away. And you probably heard, as I received many messages from friends who were not Land Rover people, about his custom Land Rover used as his hearse. So I've got a couple articles here piecing together details. Where's, where's Jeff Foxworthy when you need him? If you spend 16 years designing and building your own hearse, you just might be addicted to rovers. <laughs> Prince Philip decided <laughs> that the Land Rover Defender TD5 130 was going to be the vehicle that carried his coffin 18 years ago. According to Buckingham Palace, Prince Philip decided that the Land Rover Defender TD5 130 was going to be a vehicle that carried into the coffin 18 years ago. He went on to design the chassis cab to his specifications. Prince Philip added an open top rear section to the car so that the coffin could be carried on it. He had the car painted dark bronze green, and the original color of the car was, in fact, Belize green. He chose this color because it was used for military Land Rovers, and it was dedication to the military background that the Duke had. The palace has, in fact, noted that the car stayed at Land Rover themselves since it was built in 2003. Land Rover collaborated with the Royal Household to prepare for the funeral since then. The final changes of the vehicle were made back in 2019. And let me go to this other article because it had some more detail. And then we want to come back to the previous article. Remind me because it lists all the vehicles that the Royal Household has had. The leading set of wheels is a converted Land Rover Defender 130 gun bus built by local specialist Foley's. Uh, known as the oldest family-run company in the world dedicated to the Defender brand, Foley's delivered a hand-built Defender 130 gun bus for the Duke to use at Sandringham in 2016. In traditional British tradition, that is the sentence in traditional British tradition, a gun bus is a car or tractor-driven box in which members of a shooting party sit as they are driven around an estate to new shooting locations. So that is your... Prince Philip custom Land Rover 130. 
back to the original article, it says, seems like the only cars that the royal family owns are Land Rovers, but not the case. Some of the cars that they own, which include official and unofficial vehicles, are a Rolls-Royce Phantom 6, Land Rover Discovery, Land Rover Freelander. Yes, a royal household has a Freelander. And asked him, I'm guessing no member of the royal family has to ride in it, though. That's that's for one of the staffers. <laughs> the footman. An, an Aston Martin DB6, an Audi A8 limousine, Jag XJ, a Bentley Continental Flying Spur. When the Queen travels to official affairs, she has a state of cars which include three Rolls Royces, three Daimlers, two Bentleys. The Queen has been seen driving around her holiday home, often in one of her all-time favorite cars, which is a Land Rover Defender. Fun fact, the Queen is the only person in the country that is allowed to drive without a driving license. One of the most famous cars that the Prince Charles owns and has been seen driving is his DB6, Aston Martin DB6. It was given to him on uh, by his parents on his 21st birthday. And I also learned that she does uh, she is exempt from seatbelt laws and she does not require number plate on her car. Yep. I wonder, I wonder if she is uh, exempt from speed laws. In theory, uh, yes. I would, I, well, I'd say if you're exempt from a license number plate and having to being able to drive without a seatbelt on, I suspect it's, you know, any laws. Well, yeah. I mean, they pull her over. What are they going to do? Take a license away? There's no license to take away. Exactly. Dixon, do you know if that applies in Canada? Does she need a license in Canada? Were she to drive there? Probably not. Yeah. Because she's also. Well, we recognize other countries, driver's licenses, things like that. And (laughs) since the UK is deemed, she doesn't need one. Well, if she went for a drive here, she doesn't need one. Mm -hmm. She is the head of state. For the well, country. Her, her face is still on the money. Oh, yes. Maybe, maybe that's the license. Have you seen <laughs> there you go. Here's my license right here. Have you have you seen the loony? <laughs> <laughs> Related but different, ex-Crown Surveyor recalls his Land Rover being seized and modified for the Duke on Solomon Islands. So one of the special touches of Prince Philip's funeral, of course, as we know, was uh, was his Land Rover. But it is not the first time the Duke of Edinburgh has had one of his vehicles modified, a fact known only too well by a former crown surveyor from Brockenhurst, whose vehicle was seized and transformed to transport the royal couple around the Solomon Islands in 1974. Bill Jackson was second, second to the South Pacific Islands by Ordnance Survey in 1973, and only a few months later, Preparations were being made for royal visit to Guadalcanal by the Queen, accompanied by Prince Philip, Prince Anne, Captain Mark Phillips, and the late Lord Mountbatten. He recalled arrangements were supervised by the governor of of the protectorate, who faced the delicate task of finding suitable transport ashore after disembarkment from the Royal Yacht Britannia. An open-topped vehicle was required, so the departmental Land Rover, which I use for work, was requisitioned and hastily transformed from a grubby green to brilliant, dazzling white gloss. A carpeted wooden box was placed on the floor behind the cab, and a temporary handrail attached to the roof for the royal hand to grasp when negotiating potholed roads. The Land Rover was then deemed ready to convey Her Majesty to receive the acclamation of the citizens of Guadalcanal. The funny thing was that the guy who converted it was a rather rough Australian who was never all that keen on royalty, but I must say he did a very good job, and I expect Prince Philip would have cast a beady eye over it, unquote. Uh, The local press featuring the photo reported that minutes later, the open vehicle was useless as torrential rain set in for the rest of the day. (laughs) A member of the Commonwealth, uh, Solomon Islands achieved independence in 1978 with the Queen as head of state represented by a governor general. I wonder if the, the Queen jumped in and drove off when it started raining. Certainly could have. She knows how to do it. Yeah. And Land Rover Defender, the new one, stars in new overlanding documentary. The ANE Network and Land Rover North America are partnering on a new documentary called All You Need to Know Overlanding. The 60-minute doc premiered April 18th. We're guessing LR loves this project as its cars, particularly Defender, have been historically known for the practice. Uh, The TV show will features, because it's already happened. I I actually, I've I've watched it. Uh, The TV show features the new Land Rover Defender and will is hosted by outdoor enthusiast Christian Murphy. Murphy will take global overlanding expert Scott Brady on a five-day off-the-grid trip through the U.S. uh, Southwest. Actually, it's Scott Brady of Overland Journal fame who takes Murphy on the overlanding. And it's only five days in a new Defender. I mean, how hard could that be? All packed, all packed into 60 minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they drove a 1955 Series 1 all the way across the country or something. 
Uh, the show will equip you with all you need to know, including overlanding background in history, planning, driving techniques, expert advice, tools, and resources. Yeah. All Have you me. need to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was expecting a six, you know, six episode edition, but it turned out it was just a one episode edition. Um, having watched it, it was good to watch. It was interesting. I found it interesting, but you're not getting all you need to know. You're dipping your toe into the overlanding world. Well, it's, it's, it's like being YouTube certified. You watch uh, one little show and suddenly you're an expert. Part of that whole lifestyle brand business that you keep hearing about, this is an extension of that lifestyle brand where you, know, you can go, to, you can travel to the, uh, you know, the North Rim of the Grand Canyon and you can camp overnight and you can do it in New Defender. You know, you need to take this, this and this and there, look, there's still space in the back of the vehicle. You, know, you can do it in a 1971 Ford Country Squire too. I mean, you know, there's interstate highways. I mean, what's, what's the driving to the Grand Canyon? Woohoo. Well, they, they did go on some off-roads and uh, they, they no, weren't no. all, it wasn't all interstate. And taking, yeah, drive. taking trails to the canyon is one thing, I guess. Yeah. And they, they did overnight and you know, sleep there or for as far as we driving in the canyon. That would be. Yeah, they, they did not do any in-canyon driving. That would be a test. This, I think, would be good if you have uh, a spouse or a friend who is, you know, hey, what's overlanding about? I think this would be kind of a good little introduction to see uh, how things go, especially in the in the nice way. Very comfortable, <laughs> a comfortable for, overlanding for the people you know that don't get it. I believe it's now available on on demand. I guess it was at the History Channel. Was it History or did I say Discovery? I forget. Oh, A and E Network. So whatever A and E Networks, uh, whatever conglomerate they belong to. Yeah, exactly. And related, a night you should instead maybe consider taking instead of a new Defender 110, you could take a 1971 Land Rover Doormobile. I think probably better equipped for overlanding. Overland camping is four by fours with rooftop tents is all the rage, but the idea actually can be traced back decades. In the 60s and 70s, doormobile pop tops transformed Land Rovers and other vehicles, mostly vans, into camping rigs. The 71 doormobile is a prime example, and it's for sale right now at Hemmings.com. Uh, this Land Rover is said to be one of 830 built by Martin Walter of Folkestone, England, between 61 and 75. The heart of the build is the doormobile fiberglass pop top. Hinged at the side, it opens to provide increased headroom and upper sleeping space for two cots. It also has opening skylights. Inside, there are two rows of seats with the front bench seat divided one-third, two-thirds. The two-thirds passenger section can be reversed to face the rear seats and a table which stores in the tailgate can be installed between them. The seats can also all fold flat for additional sleeping space. The Land Rover's rear compartment houses a small closet, a sink basin, and a stove. The original engine has been replaced with a gasoline-powered 4.3-liter GM V6, good for the claimed 195 horsepower, 250 pound-feet of torque, which the seller notes is more than double the output of the original two and a quarter four. It's paired with a four-speed manual gearbox with a fairly overdrive and is, of course, four-wheel drive. Located in Mesa, Arizona, this Land Rover is for sale. At an asking price of $72,500 American, you might pay that much for a modern SUV with a rooftop tent, but that would just be following the crowd. This vintage rig stands apart from the herd. And if you click on the Hemmings link, as of this moment recording, uh, it's actually, it looks like it's at $59,500 negotiable. It's actually fairly, uh, besides color, and the engine, it seems to be all there. You don't like the color? Well, it's not. It's not the original color. No, but it's a. I, I know. I think it's a attractive well, color's color. Color's fine. Yeah, color's fine. But I mean, you could change that if I guess if you wanted. Does Does it have the correct number of rivets, Dixon? <laughs> it appears to, but the pictures don't show if it's got some of the uh, the side lights or uh, some of the other uh, doormobile aspects to it because it has been does look like it's been restored, but it's been very well done is it a two or two a um 71 would be a series three. Oh, a series three okay because it has a metal dash uh, so that'd be a late two a yeah 71 could still be a two a it's got a series three grill on it that's true yeah and yes and the door cards are canvas door cards are um exmoor trim yeah okay good i mean it i guess i agree with you it looks like it has been restored looks like it's in good shape and you know for the price it seems decent especially not 75, but 60. 
No, oh, but you know, series trucks are collectible now, so that'll hold the value really well. Yep. Hence, it's selling on a place like Hemmings. Moving on to Oxford news. Uh, the Motor Week segment uh, played, and it is now available uh, to watch on YouTube. We'll have a link in the show notes, of course. It's four minutes and 32 seconds. It's called We Drive a 1955 Land Rover that traveled 18,000 miles from London to Singapore. Even though it's short, I thought it was very well done. I thought they did a nice job. Yeah, well, as as always, their production quality is, is really quite good. So uh, go check that out, especially if you're a... Oxford fan. And actually this video would also be good to introduce to your friends, spouses, uh, family members who are, Hey, what's all that Oxford business about that you keep rambling on about? I think this would be a good intro. Well, yeah, cause it's only four and a half minutes. It's not like sitting through the whole first Overland video and then the last Overland video and, and all the other stuff that's out there. <laughs> and lis- listening to Adam Bennett go on for two episodes of the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Two, ep- two months takes two months to hear the whole story from him. There's actually, speaking of videos, um, David Shorts put out the second video of Oxford in America. It's available on YouTube now. It is, and it uh, features um, some people you might know. It does. It does. Part of it's about the the possibilities of its trip to Canada, which obviously never happened because the border got shut down 405 days ago. Not that you're counting. Not that I'm counting. Come to think of it, three of... The uh, three of the four of us on the podcast were in in that video. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will get Mark Love on the show. Mark Love made an appearance in that video and a friend of ours, known him for a long time. Now that he's retired, time to get him on the show and talk about his Land Rover experience. Dr. Love. (laughs) You probably know him from LRO, from Guns N' Rovers. Yeah, you'd know him as Series Guy. Continuing on about Oxford. Uh, LRO, Land Rover Owner International Magazine, did an article about Oxford's Odyssey, the ongoing journey of the first overland Land Rover. And the podcast got a shout out there. So thanks very much for that. And the uh, Vintage Grand Prix Hill Climb event. Uh, That was fixed. That was that fixed? They were were very kind. They spelled Pittsburgh incorrectly. And they... Well, yeah. That's a crime that that deserves punishment. (laughs) It's against federal law. And they suggested that the Vintage Grand Prix was a hill climb. I messaged them and they were very kind to uh, quickly change it. They spelled Pittsburgh correctly. And it just says uh, Vintage Grand Prix event. Yeah, no no self-respecting Scotsman likes seeing Pittsburgh without the H on the end. And speaking of the Vintage Grand Prix, it looks like it's on this year. So if you are... Cool. So inclined and want to come to the Pittsburgh area in July, um, you know, we'll be, I plan to go to the Vintage Grand Prix. Yeah, maybe I should debut the 130. Oh, absolutely. You should definitely Ooh, bring out the 130. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. The the Cummins powered 130 for those who are keeping score. Which is fantastic. I was actually allowed to drive it for a short distance. It was very exciting. Very exciting. That's a yeah, yeah, nine tenths of a mile. That's your limit. <laughs> Not that he was counting. <laughs> 0.9 miles. That's your limit. It's surprisingly quiet and just and very nice. It was just, it was smooth. And uh, yeah. Well, well, all the things you say about your Jetta is, is that's true. Is, yes. is, that's and that's the common rail diesel. That's just, that's their big, yeah. big thing. What's the horsepower on that or torque and or torque? You know? uh, 165 and 310. Okay. And that 310 is available at, at, at peaks at 1800 RPM. <laughs> so it's, it's usable torque. It's nice and low. And actually, uh, I think 75% of that's available at 1600. So, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a, it's just like the old Cummins. They like to be lugged. And I, I like how you told me that you always start out in second gear because first gear is too, gear too low. It's useless. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's so low. It's just useless. That's I the just, one thing I did. I wanted to do, Harold. Maybe next time you'll let me put it into first and actually try to, I want to see how. Oh yeah. How slow no, it is. So we'll take it out in first gear, low range sometime yeah. if you really want to want to thrill. I did. I did want to try that. But you can get out and walk alongside at red line. <laughs> And also in this LR article, they talk about Oxford in New Zealand. So I'll read some of that. We are working to get the New Zealand folks on the podcast, just haven't uh, gotten to things to match up. They are 13 hours different than us in time. So it's, it'll take a little more time. We will get Yeah, it's show. tomorrow afternoon over there now, I think. Isn't it? It's in the future. Something like that. Yeah, they're, they're in the future. That's the problem. We need a time machine. 
The wheels in Wanaka Land Rover meet, and the Oxford and Wanaka Safari over the Easter weekend saw dozens of Land Rovers and hundreds of enthusiasts joining Oxford for a spectacular traverse of jaw-dropping mountainscapes, raising $4,500. Dollars, I assume those are New Zealand dollars for the local Wanaka search and rescue team. There's pictures in this article, but also you may have seen them on Facebook. I th don't, I think there's a YouTube channel for this that has these pictures and yeah, New Zealand is, uh, is in fact jaw dropping landscape. Oxford was even visited by local resident Gemma Knott, whose father, Henry Knott was one of the oh, first oh. original, yep. First overland members. And had she seen it before? As the expedition's chief engineer, Henry would have got to know Lin, uh, Oxford inside and out. He, he also penned first overland books, mechanical notes appendix, which ends with the immortal words. The mechanic does not wash up breakfast. He maintains his vehicle. Uh, sorry, Harold. There's no, there's no mention whether she knew about it or not. Maybe actually that's what we need to find out as part of the podcast is. Uh, Maybe we need to get her on the show. We need to get her on the show. Oh Yeah. Okay, Gemma, if you're listening, you are invited to the show. Or anyone in New Zealand who, or anybody. And if you're not it. listening, start listening and then come on the show. If you're not listening, someone else, please invite her to the show. And what's next for Oxford? Oxford is still some years away from a quiet retirement. Adam Bennett's dream is for Oxford to cross seven seas and seven continents and visit as many places as possible. Adam is looking for good suggestions. So anyone wanting to put an offer forward, please do so. Oxford has already been retired. So why would it, Oxford need to be retired again? So there's your Oxford in the world news, <laughs> or Oxford, New Zealand. Oxford down under. And that's the news for April 2021. Welcome to the Center Steer podcast with our guest, Daniel Smith who works for Land Rover Ventura. You are our first guest who has worked for Land Rover in a dealership. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So you're in Ventura, California. Yes. Just to be clear. Southern California. Coastal Southern California. The high rent district. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> yes. pays well. What do you do for the dealership? So I started off in sales there, and that was in 2013. I did that for a number of years, but as time went on, I started picking up different duties. Uh, one of them was photography because of my background in film and video. Then I started doing the offsite deliveries and I do deliveries to, you know, high profile, um, you know, sports um, players, musicians, actors, directors, producers, things like that. Um, people, who, are, people who can't be bothered to come to the dealership to pick it up for themselves. You know what? They don't even shop for their own car. They go through mm. They, they have go people through a for broker. That. They do have people for that. Yeah. And then they have people like me. Um, you know, I, I take a company car and then the trucks kind of leave separately and I have paperwork. Sometimes I'll do multiple deliveries in a day and I'll just meet up with, cause we have our own flatbed trucks and I'll just meet up with the different trucks, you know, in um, different parts of mostly, you know, Los Angeles, the West side, um, Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and we even go as far as like San Diego, uh, Nevada. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll go out to Las Vegas and do a delivery. But these are people who, like I said, they don't even shop for their own cars. They just, they know what they want and they have somebody else do the shopping for them. Right. And it shows up at their house and they get the key and off they go. Yeah. I imagine That's the right. negotiation is a very simple process. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't even get involved in that. For me, it's really simple because I'm, I'm just you know, get the signatures and then show them how to operate the the vehicle, the features, the accessories, things like that. Sounds like a really cool job, actually. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, you know. don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, because you know you're you're doing it's the good part. You know, that's that's the cool stuff. The car shows up, you get to show them how to use it and all the features, yep. and yeah, that's the yep. good end of it. I said, do you carry an autograph book with you? Yeah, not not at all, not for me, um, because I don't. I, I have gotten a, a few autographs. Like I got some albums signed for my wife. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say who it was, but um, I did get some, some albums signed for my wife one time. And then they sent me one time with two hefty trash bags full of basketballs for one of the Lakers to sign that I was delivering to. <laughs> nice. And then, and then I did get a, a selfie, uh, a coach of a major sports team here in Southern California me and him flipping off one of my friends who really loves that team. And he knows that I could care less about it because I'm not into sports. There you go. Even better. So, yeah. 
Yeah, a lot of fun. That's cool. I think that, it, that make for a fun coffee table book, though. You know, celebrities who who take possession of Land Rovers. Yeah, that that would be a big book. That would. that would be a huge book. Yes. A shorter yes. book would be celebrities who don't have Range Rovers, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. So do, do celebrities buy anything but Range Rovers? Do they get discoveries or now are they getting new defenders? Um, we had one uh, kind of pop star. Uh, she got a defender, but for the most part, if they've got the money for a full size Range Rover, that's exactly where they go. I guess the defend the new defender is nice, but it's just not quite enough, huh? Well, it's a, it's a nice car as far as like driving and stuff like that, but it, it's not a luxury vehicle like like a Range Rover. Yeah, it just just and doesn't it, doesn't scream Range Rover like a Range Rover screams. Range yeah, Rover. and it's it's it wasn't made to be. I mean, it's we have our we have our utility line, our lifestyle line, and then our luxury line, and the the they're opposite ends of each other. Right. Does the new Defender sell well in Ventura? The new Defender, they're going out all the time. I okay. mean, that is, it's a, because look at what you're getting. I mean, you're getting a car that has all of the technology and the drivetrain and the capability and, and the space of, say, a Range Rover or Discovery, but you're getting it at, at a, you know, a, for, especially for like a Range Rover, you're getting it at almost half the price, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So for, for for that car that you're getting, it's a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of car for the money that you're that you're paying. Unless you buy the Defender X, which is <laughs> yeah, or yes, that new V8 have, coming up, which is going to be over hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kind of like the uh, what was the the uh, they had the Jag, um, the small Jag, the XE that they threw a V8 in for, and they were all sold out before they uh, mm. before they even hit the hit the shore, you know? So how did you get into Land Rovers? I, I take it you were involved in the, as a Land Rover enthusiast before you started working at the dealership. Oh yes. Yes. It goes back. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long dance uh, between <laughs> me getting into them and, and actually working for them. So, so, so working at the dealer allows you to scratch your itch on someone else's dime. Is that what I'm hearing? You know what? And let me tell you, it is so nice sometimes to, to just grab a car, go out, hit the trail with, uh, you know, some customers come back, drop the car in detail, tell them to clean it up, gas it up, and then jump in another one and take off and go do something else. So it, it's kind of like, you know, living like the queen, I guess. Take us back to the very beginning. All right. So the memory's a little fuzzy on this because it, it does go back quite a long time. I mean, I was born in 69 and what I've, what I've traced it to, because I, I actually, when I saw the, the Land Rover that I ended up buying, when I, when I was kind of in the market for a car, I didn't have my driver license yet, but I was getting close. Well, that's um, the perfect time to start looking. Yeah, it, it is. And when I saw the, the Land Rover that somebody had for sale, I didn't even know what it was called. I just knew what I knew the look of it because I had seen it somewhere before. And when I was growing up, my mom, she would, all, I mean, you know, single mom, um, busy. The TV was kind of like our babysitter a lot of times. And she'd always throw, you know, throw what she called, she just called them animal shows. You know, that was the catch all. Yep. There and you go. that was back in the day, as you probably know, of uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Oh, yes. Always series Land Rovers running around on there. So it was imprinted as far as, the the vehicle itself i just didn't know what it what it was what it was called where it was from anything like that well you and, don't have to know the name to know it's cool <laughs> yeah exactly that that's kind of how i saw it you know that was around the time uh 19 you know 1986 1987 that was about the time that the suzuki samurais hit the shores here and i went oh, dear. And test drove, i went and test drove one of those because i was actually kind of like hey this is uh you know this is like something kind of what I remember. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a Jeep, but it's not a Jeep. But I I, I went to the dealership and and I, I kind of found out, now nah, this is not what I'm looking for. And it wasn't, but maybe two weeks later, I saw a red 1963, poppy red 1963 short wheelbase sitting in a uh, Vaughn's parking lot. That's the supermarkets that oh, we yeah. have around here. Oh yeah. Um, it, with a for sale sign in the window. And I contacted them and I ended up buying that thing. And that was my first car. Good for you. Did you name it? Uh, I didn't name it, but it didn't take me probably uh, within a month. I had that thing rattle can 
spray painted white and I brushed on zebra stripes. Of course you did. Of course you of did. Course, <laughs> of course I did. Sure. That's exactly what I did. Well, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna brush on the zebra stripes, why didn't you uh, nine inch roller the white? I mean, come on, go for it. <laughs> I probably could have done that, right? You, sh- you should have, you should have done red and w- and white zebra stripes. I I could have gotten away with that since the car was already red. But you know what's funny is even as a as a a young lad, seventeen years old, I knew not to paint the galvanized capping. I kn- I knew that much. Oh, that's good. Well, you're one of the few. Yeah, I've seen some of the jobs going around, you know. But I knew not to paint that, so it had I had to put a I uh, painted the whole roof black it had fixed windows and uh whole black roof, roof black. california then, <clears throat> yes i know it it probably probably wouldn't have lasted uh too long like that but that was like my first um that was my first experience and that's when i i guess became a member of the bloody knuckles club because i was always under that thing going down to um british pacific when they were in pasadena buying parts getting up under the Land Rover and twisting off some, uh, you know, bolts and nuts that were older than I was. How long did you have the, uh, the 63? I had that one. Um, I think about, I think around three, four years, probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you regret, yeah. uh, getting rid of it? Of course I do. I knew it. I just, I was a leading of course I do. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is every other one I've purchased since then, I still have. Ah, so okay. I learned, I learned my lesson early. So, so the collection is missing one. <laughs> it is. And, and all I have that I maybe could ever find that one with is, a uh, the license plate number, but I don't even know if that would do it. You know, you don't at this have point. The VIN? I can't find the VIN on anything that I have. Really? It's your first just, one. I thought the first one, you always memorize that stuff just because I was 17. I don't yeah, I well, mean, well, I was <laughs> 16 and I bought my first car and I still remember the VIN number. <laughs> what did you do? What happened to to it after three or four years? Did you sell to somebody or? Yes, th- there was there was a guy who I guess he was going around leaving notes on these things or something, and I think he called himself Mister Rover or something like that. And he was he was out of Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara area. So, and um, I don't know. It maybe it went to Northern California or something like that. Um, I I don't know if. Uh, here, let's pause here a second. There, there's a rover of a different kind. Uh, yes, that's Sport. His name is Sport. When we got a dog, they had uh, three choice of names, Ranger, Rover, or Sport. So that was <laughs> that's what they chose. You, you need a fourth, you can call it Supercharged. <laughs> H- HSC, right? Yeah, there you go. I'm just rangy. <laughs> there you go. That That one went, you know, like I said, I think it went maybe towards the northern part of California or something like that. It, it had um, the kind of the, you know, it had some distinctions about it. Like I said, it had fixed windows. I know tops are easy to change out, but it had fixed windows and it had a fuel filler coming out the, uh, one of the um, side panels on the rear that um, under, I think it was under the license plate, which would fill a second tank that was underneath. Mm. And that is kind of the only things that I know that were distinctive about that vehicle, that and, uh, and the zebra stripe paint job. But I don't know if that was kept after it was uh, purchased. Well, may- maybe we have a listener who may know something about the vehicle, so maybe we might help you to uh, to, to relocate your '63. Any anything else about it that you recall? So it was a short wheelbase. It was a '63, red at one originally red. Yes, originally red. Um, and as far as fun things go, you know. Uh, we used to be able to go off-roading in parts of the Los Padres National Forest here. They've closed that down. They've even closed down camping in a lot of places because of some toad. And it toad about the size of a quarter. And let me tell you, when you're sitting in the campgrounds that are open, those toads go hopping by you by the hundreds while you're sitting around the campfire. So I think they're doing just fine. But um <laughs> We, we used to go, we used to go out, uh, on this place called Cherry Creek. You could go up there in the snow. It was really nice. One time we put my brother in, in, in he got to ride what we called the donut. And you probably know, uh, what that is. And we stuck him up there in the, in the spare tire on the hood. And you should have seen, she should have seen him 
<laughs> started jumping when we started driving towards the bushes because he knew what was coming. <laughs> he you should have taken him into the lake. <laughs> he, he was, was going to get for the tube. Pinstriped. Yeah, uh-huh. exactly. Uh-huh. So, you know, I, I had fun. I had fun with that car. I, I even had a, because, you know, you got to figure back in the late 80s, uh, you didn't see too many of these running around. And I, I have been pulled over by police officers and stuff, just wanting to know what it was and um, ask about it. Cause oh. they're, you know, now they're e- unique, but even, even then they were, right. um, they were, you know, something to, to behold for most people. Yeah. They were rare and, and unique. Yeah, certainly. And, and plus, I mean, they did that also because the, the Land Rover is one of the few things they could keep up with in those Dodge diplomats. <laughs> <laughs> So they could pull you over. So they did. Yes. That, these vehicles uh, were never fast. I don't think they were meant to be, but no. you know what? It's, <laughs> it, it's everything else is so much more fun. It, it, it's totally worth it. Well, they teach, they teach you patience. They teach you a slower pace. I, absolutely. Did you work? So you worked on that, that series truck? I did. I worked on that one myself. And that's, I uh, got you the bloody knuckles club membership. That is correct. Yep. I mean, I, there was a number of parts I changed out on that. Um, you know, it started, I think with the starter was the first one I had to, had to replace. I suppose I could have rebuilt it if I was, you know, down for that, but build up your arms and hand crank it. (laughs) Yeah, that was fun too. Um, I've actually done that in, in parking lots just to see what people's reactions were. It's a good parlor trick. Yeah. Yes. It is. Yep, I love it. What t- became your next vehicle, your next Land Rover? Maybe how long was the gap from one to number two? Here's the thing. There was there was a gap in between. And um, but I still I still kind of was keeping the you know the whole Land Rover thing on my mind, you know. So like uh when it came time for a vacation, you know, um one of the places that um, we chose to go to was Belize because they had just, I had, they had just done like the, the Maya, uh, the uh, camel trophy, uh, Mondo Maya or something like that. Um, and then they had done La Ruta Maya as well, um, in 96. So we made a, a trip, uh, plan to go to Belize and which funny enough, we, our rental car was a Suzuki Samurai. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the course. speed bumps in the speed bumps in San That's Ignacio. Kind of a letdown. Well, it, it, the speed bumps in San Ignacio killed the car. I had to let it sit. I don't know if I jarred something loose or, or flooded the carburetor or something. But um, well, you shook the shook the beer can a little too much. Completely, yes. And uh, luckily, it did start back up. But I, I had a, a chance to hike part of the 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 course that they did for Camel Trophy. So Wait. it's right. It's right. Uh, right around the Lamb and I ruins there. I did that. We were, we were with the, the, the we stayed at an, a research outpost lodge. Um, we weren't researchers, but they, they let people stay there. They let, you know, tourists stay there if you want. And I had asked one of the, one of the guides for the flat, for his flashlight, because I wanted to take off and hike that part of the trail and get to the ruins before sunrise. And he thought I was crazy. He was like, you're going to do what? And, and I'm like, yeah, he goes, you're going to go by yourself. That's like, yeah, he goes, he goes, he goes, yeah, you can take my flashlight. Um, I'll be surprised if you get up there. Sure enough, at about, I think it was about 4.30 in the morning, I sat out and some of the mud I was going through was up to my knees. You could mm-hmm. feel the, you could feel the, the, the wind coming off the bat's wings as they go by your head, you know, and spider webs and whatnot, but I, but I made it up there to the, um, high temple, uh, at Lamb and I for sunrise. That was just kind of one of the things that I, that I did in between getting my next Land Rover. And, and like I said, it was something that was kind of always on the front of my mind. The next one that I got, funny enough, it was a gentleman who he lived about three blocks from me, uh, where I lived when I had my other Rover. This his house is situated in such a way that all of the aerial pictures from like about 1983 to about 2000 in, that are in the yearbook of my high school, you can see the rover sitting in this driveway because oh. he he never moved it, and I never asked 
I never asked uh, to buy it from him, you know, because I had one of my own and um, never thought about it. So when I sold mine, I remember giving him some literature that I had, you know, some magazines and books because I, I, I had, you know, I, I used to go to the, to the bookstore and buy the magazines, like when it was the 40th anniversary right now, we're, we're over the 70th. So I gave him a bunch of those. And then I think it was maybe about a few months after getting back from Belize, I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask that guy to sell it to me. And cause I want to get another Rover. And, and I did, he remembered me. The Rover was still sitting in the same spot mm-hmm. um, in the same, I mean, hadn't moved. Well, yeah, uh, and you have all those pictures so you can prove the odometer you, history. on. I it. can absolutely prove it. Yes. It's, it's just sitting there. And so I asked him and he said, well, I, I, I don't mind selling the vehicle. He said, but I kind of promised it to my daughter down in San Diego. He goes, let me call her and her husband and see what they say. And sure enough, about two days later, he called me back and he said, well, they've got a, an international scout that they're restoring and they don't have any need for this. So they said, go ahead and sell it. So I picked up a 1969 short wheelbase from him and it didn't take me, but I think about after three weekends of, of kind of wrenching on it, I had it up and going and registered and started driving that as my daily driver. And sure enough, I got back all the, 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 the books and magazines that I had given him, they were all in the back of the car when I picked it up from him. <laughs> oh, that was nice. Yeah. I wonder if he ever read them or he just tossed them in there as you handed them to him. Well, I'm thinking maybe that that's, that's what happened. Yeah. He, he also has like a, a super old MG, you know, the kind that has like the, the alternator on the front of the engine and it, the shaft goes through it to drive the cam. I don't know if you've ever seen this setup, but it's pretty yeah. wild. Well, that's an MG, so, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I got that vehicle, and I later found out that this vehicle was purchased brand new in uh, basically the next county over from me because I ended up meeting through just I – was, I was running a, 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 a staffing service for, for healthcare personnel at that time. And I was interviewing her for a position. Uh, She's a nurse. I had made some mention about, because it was raining that day, about how my car was going to be all wet on the inside. And she says, do you have a convertible? And I said, no, but I have an old Land Rover and the the water just comes in, you know, different places. You should take the top down. They stay drier inside that (laughs) way. (laughs) So she said, she goes, oh, my dad used to really be into those. And when I told her who I had gotten this one, uh, who, who this one originally had belonged to, she froze and she said you know that that was my dad's best friend and and he was just like really torn up when he died and the the sons her her um, brothers have since since sent me sent me photographs of this old um rover when they used to take it off-roading with um their dad's friend because they all had old land rovers and they would go up to um uh, like the sequoia area in California and go off-roading. So I have pictures of that car back when it was new. You have documentation of the prior abuse. I do. I have it. It's always I a good thing it. to have. Yeah. And it looked like a lot of fun too. So that, that was kind of, that was kind of an interesting little, it's a nice connection. It is. It oh, is. Yeah, and I that, still, is that is very cool. I still talk to, to these guys today. They're on Instagram. I mean, they're pretty well known in the, um, in the Rover community. Actually. Do you still stay still take them for rides? Uh, no, they don't live by me. They, they actually live. Um, I think the closest one is actually in Bakersfield. Um, Harwood is the name. Okay. Uh, but they, they do have a, a number of vehicles and uh, some of them, I think possibly even live in Oregon. Cause I think that's where the pictures were shipped from. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, do you still drive this 69? Uh, I, of course I do. Yes. Yes. And in fact, um, I, I have a few issues with it right now. We're shocked. We're shocked to hear that. Yeah. It's not, you mean, me from, you mean everything doesn't it. work perfectly all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't keep me from driving it, but I I'm right now I'm, I'm in the process of getting, I have a 94, um, classic Range Rover that, uh, I'm getting smogged and put back on the road because my daughter just got her driver's license. And then I have a 96 discovery that I'm, um, got to replace, uh, one of the heater, um, pipes and hoses on it and get that registered and back on the mm-hmm. road because I want to take the series off the road and 
kind of get it dialed in because I want that to be more like my daily, you know, every something I drive every day, my, my main vehicle, you know, um, something you but, can do in Southern California. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I guess, uh, I guess you could do it here, but it's not recommended. You know, I was driving it on, on a daily basis when I, when I was working for this staffing company. And, um, one day I I'm sitting in the office and I can see this guy, he's climbing around like under my vehicle, looking at everything. And I knew right away. I said, well, this guy has a Rover. He's, he's obviously a Rover person. So I walked out. Yeah. He's looking for what parts he can steal. <laughs> And I said, so, so where's your Rover? And he said, oh, it's in storage in um, Southern Africa. He goes, I just use it in Botswana. And I'm like, really? I, I said, do you go off? And, and he goes, we go every year. And so I got to talking to him. And um, my wife and I had just done Egypt the, the year before. And our next trip was going to be a safari. So I started picking this guy's brain. And it ended up uh, to where I was carrying like supplies and like radio collars for lions and stuff going to Botswana to meet up with some researchers that he knew over there. And also to start our safari in a 1975 uh, FC 101, if you know what that is. Oh yeah. Of course we do. Of course. Of course we do. (laughs) Control. It's the one that has that that old style center diff lock that's pneumatic. I guess you just pull right. up on a little lever. Yeah, the LT ninety five, the early Range Rovers had it too. Yep, yep. I it's, saw the, the the guy use that in the sand a couple of times when we were it's going great, around. Great when it works, but don't plan on that. Yeah, this thing seemed to be in pretty dang good working order. I mean, we used to we, we were driving like sometimes hours on end through these, they, they call them cut lines. Um, I think maybe they're for like fire breaks or just a way to quickly get through the the bush, you know, when right. uh, anything else would take you probably forever. Um, just all day long going along, you know, and, and it, it's not a small vehicle either. Uh, no, no you, could, I, you could fit a few lion tracking collars in there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, I guess it's got, the kind of the same running gear as an early Range Rover. So yeah, it is uh, a fun vehicle. Great for, um, you know, viewing a uh, game and stuff. Cause you're high up. People will convert them to campers too. And yeah. That and, yeah. That and, and, and movie vehicles for judge dread, but yeah, that's another story. Uh, yes. I saw that one, the, that big, ugly yellow thing. Yes. And surprisingly I was looking around all over in Botswana, you know, for old Land Rovers, just because I figured, well, Hey, where else am I going to see these things? You know, whenever the countries had, you know, some kind of an economy where they had enough money, they, they were a lot of them were going for the Toyotas. So I didn't see what I was looking for until I got into Zimbabwe, which at that point, the currency was officially it wasn't losing that much value to the U.S. dollar. But in reality, no. you know, the, like the bank was. Yeah, saying, officially, they can say anything they want. But. 65 U.S. to one Zim dollar and and you could get a, a cop to sell you a thousand of them on the street you know the the, the uh, harari ferrari they they call the 100 over there because it's red and it goes real fast <laughs> <laughs> so you've had a 63 short wheelbase mm-hmm. 69 short wheelbase a 94 classic and a 96 disco what else do we have in the fleet i have a 1987 classic that was sold right here within about 40 miles of me at that's Land Rover Encino. That's the first year for the, for the American classic, right? Yes, it was. Not yeah. only that, they, they came off, uh, they came off the boat. Uh, they launched that whole thing, March 17th, 1987. And this car was sold in early April. So I think it might've been one of the first ones off the boat. What color is it? It's that Dark metallic blue. I can't think oh, of the name. I know they okay. have like Pontiac blue and stuff like this, but it's that dark metallic okay. blue. I thought um, all of those were either white or green and maybe a, the odd brown. Uh, the, Portofino red was a popular one too, as opposed to poppy red. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So a 94 classic, an 87 classic. That's it. That is the fleet. It gets a great fleet, actually. The driveway's full. But with no defenders? If you look at it, no. Of course, you have access to company vehicles now. Yes, for for, for work and, and and maybe some other things and, and, you know, some outings that we do. But I have uh, one from the year I was born. I have one from the year I graduated. 
I have one from the year I got married. And then the 94, I don't know what, if, there's no significance to that year, but the, the rest of them, I have uh, uh, some, some sort of milestone personal connection. So, so what I'm hearing is you need another for the year your kids were born. Yeah. So that would be 2003, 2008. I guess the, the 03 one, I guess if I had to, it would be an LR3 with yeah. a, with a, not an LR3, sorry. It would be a disco two with a, with a 2004 uh, transfer case. Right. Right. Yeah. And the diff lock added. Yeah. 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 And yeah. for if, 08, if you had to, if I had to, <laughs> I, I don't see any reason. I mean, I, I really like the older ones. I like yeah. that, that classic look and, um, and you know, the Range Rovers actually drive really nice, even compared to, to today's standards, you know, mm-hmm. they drive very nice. I, I, I'm still processing the suitcase full of lion tags. Well, you know, it was. I'm taking this was, bag full of collars. <laughs> we're going to go put them on lions. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Did so, this gentleman allow the, you to drive his uh, series that was in Belize? Uh, not Belize in um, Botswana. In Botswana. No, no, I never got that far, and and he's been back since. Um, uh, but I, I I never got to drive his car over there because at that time something interesting had happened with this '69 um, that I bought. I had got got it going right at the so we have a British a Central Coast British Car Club uh, here in California, and they were doing for 2000. Uh, they were doing the Land Rover as the featured make for the car show, and a couple of guys. So you know, 2000. You know the the uh, message boards and and the all of that. You know the the chat rooms that you had on, what was it? AOL or whatever, Aim. you know, people, yeah, exactly. People are talking and stuff. So I had a couple of guys contact me. They're like, Hey, are you going to the Ventura show? Cause it was being held here in Ventura. It, I was like, you know, I didn't know about it, but I, I certainly will go. And I went and I ran into a couple of guys that I've, I stayed in touch with to this day. And actually one of them, uh, he goes by whiskey tango on Instagram and uh, he has a, a podcast called Horsepower Heritage. He's a big rover guy. Uh, you've probably seen some of his posts if you've looked at anything uh, to do with Land Rovers on Instagram. I, I met up with him, and then we did some outings. And uh, he was he was um, working as an associate producer um, in television. And I was planning this trip to Africa, and basically was going to get some footage to, to, you know, to rep for sale uh, of wildlife and, um, you know, landscapes and stuff like that. And so I ended up purchasing a, a, a camera to do that. And we got to talking and he ended up bringing me onto uh, one of the shows he was working on, got, you know, kind of got my way into the film and television um, industry based on that meeting with him at the uh, British car show that we had here. And, you know, we've stayed, uh, we've stayed friends, I guess, what's it now? I mean, this, this July, it'll be 21 years, you know, he's since left that industry. So have I. Um, But what got me out of it was the local dealership here in Ventura. They used my 69 as a display at a few of their events. So they kind of got to know me a little bit, here and there. And then when I got my discovery, I had gone in there for some parts and stuff like that. And one day they had asked me if I wanted to work there. And I gave them a, a pretty much a yes right then and there. And um, I switched careers. So let, let's go back though. What, what do you mean you were involved in the film and TV industry? What did that mean? Did you, you supplied cars or you were driving them or. Right. Um, so at first it was camera work. So I, I worked on, uh, I, I worked with my buddy on a, on a history channel show. Then from there I, I was doing, you know, camera operating. I was also repping stock footage that, that I had gotten. I was doing spec footage for, for, um, productions that were taking place either in, um, you know, in Maryland and in New York, there's production companies like discovery and stuff like that is, is in Maryland. Um, and, and some of these cable, uh, you know, the, the companies that sell their shows to different, you know, cable companies, 
they're in New York and they need footage out here. So they would um, hire me to go out and get various footage for them. Later on, I started getting into post-production stuff as well, like multiplane animation, uh, motion graphics. And um, I ended up getting hired by a film school to uh, work as an advisor for the, um, for the graduates and students there. And I did that for, I was like one month short of eight years working there. And then also doing the, the post-production work on the side. And then that was at that point that they had offered me a job to work at the local dealership. And the dealership rolls around. I was, I was curious if maybe you were involved in any of these car shows and I didn't know if you were involved in filming some of the rebuild shows or the, you know, monster truck shows, that kind of thing. No, I, I have, um, I have gone to a couple of productions just for the fact that I was bringing a series Land Rover. Um, I've taken, I've taken mine on a Ralph Lauren photo shoot. I think, Oh yeah, and then I took my buddies who who who's the one like I said he lives near me now. Um, I, I took his 109 to a commercial shoot for like I think it was like Bank of America or something like that. I, I, I've done that a couple of times, but that wasn't that was just you know because they needed a vehicle that type of vehicle. But it, it's fun because you can register your your cars with these services, and they will they will either truck your vehicle there or they'll pay you extra to drive it. So it's kind of fun. I, I noticed there's a, re, a retirement commercial lately here in America that's on the TV and they use a, a defender and, uh, and it's, it's just interesting. They're like, yo, it, when it's time to retire, you too can be driving around in a defender, you know, it's just an old one too, not a new one. An old the, one. Yeah. yeah. It was a heritage. Of course, I guess. Play, play your cards, right. You could be driving it before you retire, but, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's true. <another> story. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've found a lot of the people because, like I said, you know, I don't I don't know the exact math, but if you go back to 1987, what is that like 32, 33 years, whatever? I've seen coming a up lot of, on on 35 actually. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, 91 um, would be 20, 30 years ago. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, you know, they get into the vehicles based on one thing, but they find that they they're not they're not down for the whole, they're not down for the struggle, you know? Right. Right. For, <laughs> Which just means they weren't worthy. That's all. <laughs> have you owned in this, uh, since you, since you got back into Land Rovers with the 69, have you owned something that was not a Land Rover? In my life? Yes. Or have you been exclusively a Land Rover driver? Or no, you, there, there's been, I mean. Does your wife drive a Land Rover? No, my wife is a big, she's a big Japanese car fan. So uh, she, <laughs> she, hey, Man, let me tell you, all you do is put gas in them and go. So yeah, I know. It, but, it, well, it and if, if all she wants is a transportation appliance, then then yeah. Yep, good, reliable transportation, right? Turn, so turn it some go. people some people just don't get it. Yeah, there's been a Nissan, a Toyota, or two Toyotas, a Nissan, and I think one. I, I don't even want to say it, man, because it was like the worst car we ever had. It was a it, it, it was a Chrysler Cirrus. Ooh, and that thing sucks. That thing sucks yeah, so bad. Yeah. Yeah. My cousin <laughs> had one of those. That was were unpleasant vehicles. Very much so. Terrible. Terrible. But other than I mean, for, for me, I I as far as things I actually drove, one other car in my whole life. That's it. And it was? It was a Nissan. All right. Well, yeah. the the one I drove to sometimes you, know, you just gotta get to work, I guess. Well, this one was could have been a skyline. You know, no, 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 no. It was one of the little uh, the little Sentras because I drove I drove from Ventura to college in the valley, uh, you know, to Northridge every day. I didn't I didn't want to move out there, and I didn't want to change jobs or whatever or live on campus. So I just drove when I needed to drive. You know, Northridge State. So uh, California. Let's see, <laughs> California. Uh, it's CSUN is the whole right, thing. Yeah, I, yeah. It's that's state university. You got me. Yeah, California State University, Northridge. Is what yeah, it is. I, I yes. went to Fresno State, so we were your rivals, sort of. Uh, okay, yeah. I was only there for school. I wasn't there for anything else. Like I was only there for the shop classes, to be <laughs> honest. But <laughs> yep, got got my uh, sheepskin and 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 ran away. Well, I did my I did my eight years of time, and then it was time to get out of California. Yeah. A lot of people are doing that these days. Well, when I left in the early 90s, the biggest growth business sector was relocation specialists. People in the business of getting people and businesses out of California. Yeah, I'm not surprised. 
A lot of businesses were leaving in droves back then. Nothing's changed. So you're at the dealership and you you start off in sales. And then how did you get into doing the offsite delivery? And I, I think you're involved in events also. Yeah. So, okay. So here's the thing. Um, when you're working as a salesperson, you kind of need to be devoted to keeping up with your customers, right? So somebody's looking for a particular type of vehicle or they're looking for a, a particular you know, deal structure that's going to get them to a payment that they want. And, or sometimes you, we have to bring another vehicle in from another dealership, right? We got to do dealer trades is what they're called. It is a lot of, it's a lot of staying on top of that and follow up. And what happened was a couple of things. One was they tasked me for the photography for the store. So I'm doing it, you know, basically extra time at the store, weekend mornings, typically, and I'm trying to get all of the inventory photographed before I have to go to work as a salesperson. <laughs> well, it's not just taking the pictures. Then you got to crop them and edit them. Then you have to upload them and then arrange them. And, you know, oh, it's, yeah. That's work. it's not just, yeah, it is. Isn't it? It's not just right, snap the picture that'll and go. That'll eat the whole day. Yeah. So that cuts into your time being able to be an effective salesperson. The other thing, too, is that we had some personnel changes uh, when it comes to the people who are doing these deliveries um, for our fleet manager who's working with the brokers that are getting cars for these people who don't shop for their own cars. <laughs> and so, I, you know, like, for instance, one time, one of the people that, that did this was going to a a very well-known comedian. You, he's ha he, he had a new special come out on Netflix uh, last year. Um, she was going to his house to deliver a car and she got um, rear-ended coming off the freeway. Well, then she was taken off um, for medical reasons. Not Nothing bad. It's just that the doctor wanted to make sure before he really started to go back to work. So then I started doing, the, you know, picking up that slack. It, it, that cuts into your time that you can take because there's a lot of stop and start, right? It's like you can't put your whole focus on trying to get these deals made with the customers. And and then she left to go to school and I got that full time basically with my photography and the sales. When the virus hit, there were a few few personnel changes. And one of those was that the person who we had just hired to take some of the pressure off of me, they were going away and I was moved into that position full time. So you've been full time now as a offsite delivery person. Offsite delivery, the photographer for the store, you know, for the for the inventory and also running the Instagram account for the store as well. So the sales thing got taken off my plate, which which was fine because like I said, it's always better when you when the customer knows that you are devoting the time to get what they want, you know? Right. You got to focus all your attention you on to. them. Yeah. You have to, right. you know? So I guess that puts you into dealership events then, right? Yeah, and I, I've been actually kind of doing those pretty much the whole time. So we we sponsor some events, like we have this summertime event here called music under the stars where w there's acts that play in an open air venue. And the cool thing is you can, they have tables out there. You can bring your own food and, and, you know, drink and sit out there and listen to music and stuff. And I would display vehicles there, answer questions, things like that. Also the off-road events with the customers. Um, we have a couple of places here, like Hungry Valley in Gorman. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's an off-highway vehicle use area that we can go to. They have a lot of open space out there, but then they also have an area that's just dedicated to almost like uh, practice off-roading mm -hmm. where they have obstacles set up that are, some are like concrete and rock and they bring out these like uh, concrete pipes and, you know, they, they kind of make it like a little test track almost so that you can get different types of experience in one little area. You know, we call, and we call that a playground. It is. It is a totally a playground. Yeah, exactly. And and the customers love it. And then also when we do a launch of a new vehicle, we'll get sometimes we'll get vehicles 
in advance that aren't for sale, but they're here on, on manufacturer plates, mm-hmm. right? They have New Jersey plates on them, but they're all here. Not all, but a lot of them, half are, are, are at our headquarters there in New Jersey and, and the others are here in, uh, in Irvine. We'll have those to be able to display at the, the parties that we put on so that people can kind of see the the new car, you know? So you get to drive new models before they're released to the public then? You got the new Defender? You got to drive that? So about two weeks after I started with the store, I missed the the opportunity for the West Coast Americans to go and experience the the new sport that came out in 2014. So this was August of 2013. A number of the vehicles were here in country already they just weren't for sale they were um pre-production models and they wanted us to be able to get our hands on them to see what they could do and test them against the 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 previous version of the sport so i got to go on an overnight flight to monte well i mean montebello quebec i guess is where Mm -hmm. i ended up but but it's you fly into Montreal. You, you get off in Montreal and you realize you are not in California anymore. Yeah, overnight too. Yeah. And I had to rush my um, passport renewal. That cost me about $400 to get my, you know, cause, Yeah, because I, I, I never thought of it. Oh, I'm going to Canada. I've been there a couple of times and I, I've never had to have a passport. And sure enough, yeah. I guess they said since 2001, uh, any flights, flights coming in, you have to have a passport. Right. I so, still remember the good old days back in the eighties, we used to just drive there and you just drive across where you come, where you're from, where you're going and just, yep. Oh, have a nice day. We did that. We did that on the West coast. Yeah. When I was staying with my uh, grandparents one summer in in Washington, we drove across to um, Vancouver. Van- yeah. Is it Vancouver? Yeah. yeah but the okay. Blaine, the Blaine crossing there, the peace arch. Yeah. So I got, I went up there stayed at um in montebello this amazing it's the largest log cabin in the world it's where land rover has their experience the land rover experience there um for canada it was a blast i i got to meet tim hensley the uh the camel trophy uh american team member there cool that was that was cool that was a lot of fun and got to go off-roading in these pre-production range rover sports um all v8s completely specced out like everything all the options and stuff and that was within about two weeks of of starting there so it was that was like really cool that is i was jazzed i was jazzed since then i've gone for the discovery sport we did that in arizona um had a lot of fun with that car out on their version of like Hungry valley and i believe it is on a reservation there and they they made a deal with the the, the owners there and there's a tr- there's tracks and uh, trails and stuff and we got to go see how capable that little car mm-hmm. was uh, it was the replacement for the LR2 or the Freelander if you're in in some parts of the world uh, it was a Freelander here or or you're a Freelander fan and can't or, give up the name careful careful <laughs> I may I may uh, that was how I got into Land Rovers I was a Freelander owner there you go got to start so, somewhere I guess uh, you do you do it's, it's what happened. Nowhere to go but up, right? Uh, yeah, there you go. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, so and, and my next Land Rover was a Series Three. So <laughs> cool. There you go. So I, 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 I then we did the launch of the full size Discovery, also in Arizona, in a different part of Arizona. Um, on that trip, I got to meet Daphne Green, who is another U.S. team member of, of, um, camel trophy. And she's been involved with the, co- he, these people have been involved with, uh, the company for a long time. They're so knowledgeable about everything. And it's fun to meet them, of course, cause they're kind of like heroes, you know, they, they don't do that whole camel trophy thing anymore. So they're, they're, uh, that's a, a small yeah, club, you know, permanent legends. Yep. They are. And I've met also Tom Collins as well. I met him hmm. before I worked for the company at, um, I don't know if you remember, Land Rover had this thing called the Choice of Experts Tour. Have you heard of it? I don't recall that one. I got an invitation in the mail one time. This was before I was working for them. It was kind of close to you know where I live. It was about a, maybe a 40-minute drive down to uh, Malibu or the hill in the hills of Malibu. It was so cool because they had we, – we were driving uh, at that time – we must have been driving, what was it? 
it was an it was the LR. I think it was right when the LR4 came out. We were driving the new LR4. So they had an off-road section, but they rented this mansion that they used for commercials and stuff. It's it's an incredible place. They had, you could do cooking class, you could do wine tasting class, you could do some kind of kind of an art class. It was just kind of a whole lifestyle event. That's where I met one of the uh, the other uh, Camel Trophy uh, American team member as well. And that was fun. I mean, that was, again, before I was working for the company, but I definitely, I'd been wanting to work for them since 93 when they started bringing in of course, you know, the, the, uh, the discovery one, right. and they brought some defenders, as you know, the, the, uh, the long wheel base, the one Really, I, I think I'd heard that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For a short period maybe, of time. Maybe you can still buy one somewhere. You can, and you, and you can pay as much <laughs> as a current new defender too. Or more. Oh, or more. Oh, no, definitely more. Yes. Definitely, you can name or your a price lot on more. those things. Yep. Yeah, you, you can get a 90, a NAS 90 for the price of a top-end new 110. Mm -hmm. You know, or I you heard... a pair of new, new 110s and have money to spare on a, on a NAS uh, 110. Yeah, I mean, I, I heard the other day, I was uh, checking out this blog about this uh, 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 Tesla-powered Range Rover Classic. 250,000, that's only $50,000 more than this company charges for their um, LS converted uh, Range Rover Classics. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking- so Now, mind you, that's a new LS engine versus a used Tesla motor. Yeah, but I mean, in a lot of parts of the country, we're still talking about the price of a house here. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. I'm like, if you're going to drop that kind of money, why don't you just go buy a brand new full-size Range Rover You'll have the V8. You'll have a car that can do anything that car can do. And you'll have money to spare. You know, that's just wild. Did you get involved in the, I think it was the Trek events that was the new Defender re reveal here in the U.S.? Uh, <laughs> I uh -oh. wanted to. Yeah. Oh, I you wanted missed it. to. You missed it. No, it was, oh man. So what happened was we had these grand plans at the dealership to do kind of our own trials at the dealership. A lot of it involved inter, you know, interacting with the vehicle. I mean, it could be jacking up the car, tire change, all of this stuff. And I knew I was going to blow everybody away because they needed uh, one person from sales. And I'm like, okay, well, I've got this. Well, we let it go on and, and it got to the point, I guess nobody was watching the clock. I wasn't. They said, we need your entry today. And our manager just said, put your business cards in the hat and we're going to pick a card. <laughs> and I, my card wasn't drawn. So I get to drive the car. Um, you know, I've driven the, we bought the car for the store and it's a great car. I, I got to drive it to the Defender launch that we did in La Quinta. I mean, La Quinta's, you know, a lot of people around here are going to know La Quinta in your part of the world. I don't actually, I don't even know what your part of the world is, but uh, I know you're not, I know your East Coast time. Yes, we're near Pittsburgh. Okay, Palm Springs would be the general area. Okay. And right. that was that was a blast. Not only did I get to drive the Trek car um, down there, and sure enough, we're at this, you know, really swanky high-end resort there. And uh, the valet guys, they when they went to go park it, they didn't move it, but about four feet, they left it right there in the front where everybody coming in in their Bentleys and everything, could see it. And more pictures were taken of that car that weekend than any other. I mean, they were coming up on Instagram and everything. It was really funny. Got to drive the new Defender. We, we left south on the highway, but then we cut off, got into the kind of the Anza Borrego, Mexicali area and drove uh, for a number of miles off road in deep sand. And man, that car was just like, was a dream. I, I've been out there in Anza Borrego in my series. Um, and I even covered some of the same territory that we did in the defenders. And, and at one point, cause we only had the, we were driving the one tens. They had a few nineties that we could look at, but they, they weren't for driving. And there were some areas there that I knew I had gone over in my series that these cars couldn't because the breakover was just too great. Right. And, and th with the one tens, and obviously a 90 would be able to do it, but with the, with the one tens, 
I think you just have to hit it hard and rely on the suspension absorbing everything on the other side, I guess. I don't know. Just plow your way through it. Yes. Yes. You, you can, sometimes that's how you do it, right? With the open diffs, you gotta, you gotta build up a little momentum. Do right. You, do you take your, uh, your trucks off road? Yes. So my, my 69, I've done Anza Borrego, which is, I think for California, I mean, it, it, it is, it is up there. It's gotta be in the top three or four for California. It's desert, but it's, it, 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 it's a big slope that goes up to, goes up to some really high um, mountains where they have like observatories and stuff like that, you know, like really high up uh, behind San Diego County. So there's all these washes that are coming down from the mountain. If you go one direction, it's just like up and down, up and down, up and down. And like I said, the breakover angles are, are pretty steep, you know, they're pretty sharp and um, it's a lot of fun. You get to, you know, it does change uh, topography out there. There's sandy areas. Uh, there's um, kind of like dry river beds, things like that. I've done that. I've done uh, Gorman a couple times or, or Hungry Valley with my series a few times. My 96 Discovery, we took, uh, my family and I, we, we went to what I think is the best uh, overall off-roading experience in California, which is um, Calico. It's basically, I guess you could say just to the east of the Calico ghost town by Yermo, California. It's, it's out like, you know, Mojave it's, desert. It's, kind of yeah, stuff. it's way out in the desert, way out. But the thing is, is that it is like a miniature Moab because you have places where you're driving through these bright red rock canyons that are sheer cliffs, you know, that just go up straight on either side of you. Like you're driving through, uh, a city with skyscrapers, you know, there's like tunnels you can drive through arch. There's like this big arch out there. Um, you know, like the kind of crazy people swing from, you know, when they're doing their, I don't know, extreme sports or whatever. <laughs> and, and, and the, the disco one barely fits through, um, through it, but it does. Did you let the air have to let the air of the tires? I, I, you know what, funny enough. Um, I, I know all about that, right. We set off, and first obstacle going up a slight incline with, with a, a, a washed out kind of rut in the middle that was full of loose um, pebbles and stuff S started to go up that made it about 10 feet, all kinds of wheel spin. And my wife's like, you know, like, Oh, I guess this is as far as we're going to go. Huh? I said, no, I damn it. I forgot to let the air out of the tires. Went out there, let the air, and then it was like not. It was like driving up a, a driveway. <clears throat> Went up there, and there was some parts where um, my older daughter and my wife got the hell out of the car. They're like, "Hey, there's no way I'm going up that thing in this car." <laughs> so they they got out and watched. They ba you know? bailed on you, and they watched from a safe distance. They bailed and watched. Yep, Quitters. but it was it was it was fun. It's it's so it's if you ever get a chance to go there. Yep. Uh, if, if, if you come out this way, like I said, I, I think it's the best overall off-roading experience just because of the, and it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty open out there. Like people go camping and like, they just like shoot guns, like right out of their campsite. They have huge bonfires. I even saw a guy driving up to one of the caves and he was hauling a bunch of firewood because him and his party his friends were going to go have a party down in the cave later that evening. So, and I've seen people out there with, um, you know, these speaker stacks that you see at concerts, like, oh, yeah. like, oh, yeah. you know, 10 foot tall or, oh, yeah. you know, a couple of five foot things stacked. I've seen people with huge campsites with these stacks set up. I mean, you can pretty much do what you want out there. It's really cool. Is your uh, disco per chance, is it a stick or is it automatic? It's an automatic. Automatic SE7 with the, uh, with the four, 4.0, and the um, the coil packs. It's actually been a really good vehicle compared to what I've heard some people say. It's it's had uh, you know a few issues here and there. Um, the, the 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 biggest one, of course, was the the head gasket leak coming off the the back of the driver's side, and then completely taking out the crank. It was at the crank case position. No, I think is it, whatever one goes on the that reads the flywheel. That's the crank position sensor. The crank position sensor. That man, let me tell you, diagnosing that was a nightmare. 
I went to go to work one day, I stepped on the gas, getting on the freeway, and my car was only going about 10 miles an hour. It was making all kinds of weird sounds. Oh, yeah. So it was a head gasket job at that time. I take it since the car has probably spent all its time in California, you still have the rear passenger wheel arches are still intact. The rear passenger wheel arches. They rust out here, especially in north the Northeast. And, and oh. you, you know they, they're about they're about done when, when your rear passengers put their seatbelts on and the bolt pulls <laughs> right out. Well, my cars, so... The, the the series I told you was from here in Southern California, from Goleta, which is now its own city. They separated off from Santa Barbara. Home of um, Moss Motors. Yes, Moss Motors, exactly. Yeah. I've got a lot of my money in past years. <laughs> yeah, but it's probably been worth it. Um, well, yeah. The the um, Let's go on to the next one. This 96 um, Discovery initially came out of a Texas dealership but it made its way to San Luis Obispo. And then the, the, 90, uh, the 87 uh, was out of Encino, which is here in Southern yep. California. Yep. Um, and it never went, it, it, I think the farthest it may have went was maybe Oakland, California, uh, before I bought it from somebody in Ojai, which is in our county here. And then a, a very dry climate as well. Um, and then this 94 was sold to a real estate developer in San Francisco area. And then it um, lived out most of its life in San Diego. And then it came here. So they're, they're all, you know, dry climate vehicles. So I see you have pith helmets on the wall. Do you wear those when you drive your series truck? <laughs> you know what? I actually have, I think I have four pith helmets. Yeah. One is in regular use uh, when I'm working on the yard. Cause I, I have a tropical garden here. And I cut my own grass. So I, I'm in the yard as much as I can. So that one gets regular use. I have one that has been to Guatemala, Belize, Egypt, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, maybe a couple other countries that I'm missing. It's been with me on these trips. And I've, I, some, I've gotten some really uh, weird looks and comments and stuff. I mean, the guys at the border crossing and uh, from Belize to Guatemala, they were like touching it. They couldn't believe it. You know, like they, they had never seen one. Except and, maybe in the movies. Except maybe in the movies. And then I have another one that's just a hanger. It's just on display. You can see it there next to the, I, I have some yam mask up there from oh, yeah. uh, Pap Papua New Guinea. Right. And then um, I think I have one. Oh, I have one that's uh, more of a, I guess not a traditional style, but more of the, I guess the military style. They're a little flatter with right. a round, with the rounded top. There you and go. I use that one to, to embarrass my family when we go out to, when we go to, cause we like to go to gardens, you know, uh, like botanical gardens and right. I'll wear that, uh, just to thoroughly embarrass my family and it, and it works. No, I mean, there, there is no better headwear in a vintage Land Rover. <laughs> there, there isn't. Absolutely. I love it. So you have four Land Rovers and you have two. And, and four pith helmets, apparently. Four pith helmets and you have two. <laughs> like the right right ratio. <laughs> and two daughters, I believe. Uh, what's yes. going to happen in the future? Are you introducing your to your children to the wonders that is that are Land Rovers? Absolutely. That's kind of been the plan all along. In fact. Good for you. The, the way I got my my 96 discovery was kind of about three years after my first daughter was born. My wife started hinting around, you know, you know, it'd be nice if she had someone else around a brother or sister kind of a thing. And I was like, yeah, that's okay. But you know, there's three seats. So there's me, the car seat and you in the Land Rover. This all sounds great to me, but there's going to have to be another addition to another addition to the family. That was a quick yes from her. So the, the that's when the disco joined uh, uh, our family. And that was because of my younger daughter. So at, at this point, um, that's her car if she wants it when she's old enough to, to drive. Right now, the 87 is technically my older daughter's vehicle, but it's at the point now where it needs to go through a full restoration. 
and it's not quite ready. So I have this 94, which is actually in really good condition and Abel's getting it uh, dialed in for me so that, you know, it passes smog. There's no issues, completely roadworthy. Because well, it's kind thing. of, it, yeah, exactly. Well, it's kind of expensive to keep since I was the only uh, person up till now, I guess, that my daughter got her driver's license that was even driving these vehicles. My, my wife always drives her car. To keep four cars registered, smog, well, not smog, of course, on the, on the 69, but registered smog and insured, it's, it's, it's not only costly, it's a, it's a hassle, you know? Mm-hmm. So that 94, it had some issues passing smog. So I, I've just been letting it sit. And so that's going to be my daughter's daily driver for now. For the most part, I think what will happen is those, uh, a couple of those vehicles are going to, you know, go with my daughters uh, wherever they go, hopefully not too far. And then my, my daily driver, once again, will be the 69. There you go. Do they uh, help you wrench on them? You know what? What's funny? They love it. Good. They lo- they love if, it. They if they're gonna if they're gonna there. get to drive them, they should be out there doing the work. Yeah, I don't have as much time to to wrench on them as I used to, and and that that's kind of sad. Well, but, but they do. But when, but when, <laughs> when I do have the opportunity to do something, you know, like um, when I was getting everything situated to to have the ninety four um, go away for a couple of weeks to be dialed in. Um, they were out there helping me, you know, get, get the, get them out of the driveway, get the driveway cleaned up, wash the cars off. Uh, We aired up the tires. I brought up the compressor and, and they had fun doing that. So they don't, they don't mind uh, getting the hands dirty. So they enjoy the experience. They, they enjoy riding in them. Yes, absolutely. And you know, we used to go to the, to the events, um, for our dealership, even before I worked there. So I have pictures of them riding in. Uh, like the new full size when it came out or we, you know, the, the test track at the dealership going over that they, they've always, they've always liked the vehicles, you know, that's great. That's good. You need cool. to continue on the tradition. It will be continued. We bleed green over here. Daniel, thanks for talking with us today on the podcast about your Land Rover experience. It's been really interesting. That's cool. I, I just did that you started out pretty much what 99, 95% of your vehicle owning has been a Land Rover. Yes, absolutely. We'll, and, we'll overlook the one indiscretion. Yeah, I mean that was just like I said, that was like a a, a college commuter kind of a deal. That was it, basically, you know. And if any of our listeners might know of where a '63 short wheelbase is that is originally red, is layers of red and white and and zebra stripes and who knows what else has been added to it. And, and fixed uh, fixed windows on the on the hard top. That's it. Fixed windows on the hard top and something. What was it about the second fuel tank? The Filler came out the back of the car. Uh, it's one of those, those rear-mounted auxiliary tanks. I've, I've never yep. filler out the back, but I, I know the tank that it would work with. And they cut a hole in the in that in, in the back, uh, right around the like license plate area, and that's where the filler was. All right. So Daniel's in search of his original <laughs> '63 short wheelbase. Nice. It's it's it went up north. It maybe maybe languishing in a marijuana field somewhere. Yeah. Hey, hey, that stuff's moving south too. Thanks very much, Daniel. Appreciate you coming on the program and talking with us. Yes. Thank you for having me. This has been show number 97 and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Harold, Morgan and Dixon for joining us as always on the show. Thanks guys. Yeah. Well, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks. What's the border situation like Dixon? Closed until the 21st of May now. Okay. So there's a chance you might be able to get into America this summer. I hope so. I hope so. Maybe maybe you'll come down to the Vinge Grand Prix. As soon as the border opens, as I've told my boss, I'm gone for a month at least. (laughs) (laughs) And you're spending all your time in New Jersey? Well, it depends when I'm down there. I have to go over to see your Grand Grand Prix and see what else is going on down there. Well, and if you're if you're driving your your truck back to Canada, you should stop off here. If you uh, go due north out of Pittsburgh on 79, it'll take you right into Hamilton, Ontario. But due north of where I'm going is 81. I'm going right across the whole state of Pennsylvania to go north, and then cross at Niagara Falls, go around to Hamilton and such, and then all the way back across 
the equivalent of the state of Pennsylvania. See, you need you need to get all the driving that you didn't do in 2020 in on 2021. You got to make up that make up driving. Be interesting to map it out because you're certainly not going to drive a, a 51 on an interstate or a Canadian divided highway nowadays. US 30 Lincoln Highway. You can you can go where Oxford went. Mm-hmm. That's and true. Probably at a tad better velocity too. I would I would hope. Well, one would hope. Yeah. <laughs> Twelve miles an hour in first gear, feathering the throttle. Yeah, that that's yeah. And Dixon, we'll do our best to join you and give you an escort. Oh, thank you. A little motorcade action. Consider, consider it. I will. Well, now there's a there's a new fuel tank for Ravis waiting in New Jersey for me to put in, so I don't have the one gallon jug. Ah, so so it's a it's it's a singular tank. It's not like a, an auxiliary or an extra tank. No, it's a stainless steel one that uh, I got from Ike at uh, Pangolin. Okay. I, I take it you, yeah, the one you have, I guess, if you're using the plastic jug, it, it, it had perished. And the the POR 15 treatment and so on didn't take, so yeah. it was weeping, yeah, unfortunately. I've had, I've had mixed results out of those, those uh, tank liner things. I would have done it again, but the bill in Ottawa to have the lining burnt out was $800. It's like, no, I could buy a tank for a lot less than that. Yeah. Two tanks. Get innumerable freelanders for that kind of money. You too. could, you could yeah. <laughs> and still have uh, $800 left over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and thanks to Daniel Smith, lifelong Land Rover owner. His, as you heard, his very first vehicle was in fact a series truck and, and hopefully he gets to hand them off to his daughters. That'd be fantastic. Keep them in the, in the fold. And thanks to the one true packs for his continued production support. Appreciate it. Pax. He does a quick turnaround on some of the programs for us. So it is appreciated. We're part of the four by four radio network. And I invite you to check out the other four by four related shows at four by four radio network.com. Visit our website, centersteer.com. That's in a British spelling, C E N T R E to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's podcast, including the videos that we talked about. If you're listening to the podcast on our website, please download a podcast app and subscribe so you have the podcast automatically delivered when it's available. We post a new podcast at the end of every month. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, and voicemail. You can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer, buy a t-shirt, sticker, or even buy us a tea. Click on store on the menu on the top of our webpage. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Click on voicemail on the website and let us know. The next voicemail we'll receive the Center Steer t-shirt. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. And you may now resume your important things. The driveway's full.